Amen, church? Oh, I, I don't believe you. Our God, he is alive. Amen, church? Amen. Secure is life from mortal mind. God holds the germ within his hand. Though men may search, they cannot find, for God alone does understand. Truly, the whole world is in his hands. Amen? Yeah. Greetings from Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. Amen? It is great to be with you this morning. Uh, Kip and Elena, so grateful to be here, bro, to be invited to speak. It, I think of the scripture in Psalms 133, it is good and pleasant when brothers and sisters live in unity. Amen, church? And I know God is working powerfully through this conference. Well, you know, Washington, D.C. is an interesting place. It's a land where uh, you, you can reach out to a congressional lobbyist, where you can reach out to a colonel on the metro. Just stop to the Pentagon, right there, they come right on in. You can actually reach out to a Secret Service agent walking his dog, right on the National Mall, right there. And it's the headquarters of the most powerful nation in the world. A nation that wants to have the whole world in its hands. But it is a nation that still and always will be under God. Amen? In Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to turn here and read in just a moment, but I've been asked to speak on the topic of the whole world is in his hands. And of course, the first thing that jumped into my mind was the kid's song. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. You see, it just makes you feel better just singing it. I, I was fired up. You know, I, I kind of did some research on it. And, you know, because this, this song is sung by kids all the time, right? But it's useful for us big kids, too. And it was originally written by a full-blooded Cherokee Indian named O.B. Philpot. And, yeah, amen. Not Obi-Wan, Obi. O.B. Philpot, while he was training in the military in World War II. And when he was deployed, he left the lyrics in, the lyrics to the song in his locker. And someone found the song and managed to have it put on the radio while he was at war. And it's a great little song because it's a comforting song. It's a great little song because it states a simple truth. God has everything in his hand. Guys, everything. Your life. My life. In his hand. And in Isaiah 40, God's power is kind of laid out for us here. Because sometimes we forget that God is a majestic God, a caring God, who can protect us from all kinds of difficulties and hardships. In Isaiah 40, God's power is laid out for us here, and we're asked some serious questions. In verse 12, it says this, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breath of his hand, marked off the heavens? The answer, church? Nobody. Nobody is all powerful as God. The U.S., the world, not to mention the universe, is in his hands. Down to verse 14. Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Answer, church. Nobody. God is all-knowing. There's no one who's wise enough to teach him something he doesn't already know. Verse 15, surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands, kind of like Hawaii, amen? As though they were fine dust. Guys, verse 17, before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. That's intense. Verse 22, and this scripture is awesome, by the way, just a little apologetics uh, plug right here. Verse 22, he sits enthroned above the, 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 the flat earth? No, it says the circle, the sphere, or kurgan in Hebrew, amen? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth 
And his people are like grasshoppers. You know, the, the science world didn't figure that out until 1543 with Copernicus. This is written in 700 BC. Nice little plug to put on in there. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy, spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. Verse 26, lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. God is God and there's nothing like it. God is God and we can't even begin to understand how majestic and powerful he is. God is God and if he's for us, then how could anyone be against us? You know, that's why Paul said in Romans 8, 28, in all things, I know that God is working for the good of those who love him and have been called to his purpose. Through the bad, through the good, and through the worst of times. You know, um, just to share with you briefly, this month marks the one-year anniversary of my mom passing away from cancer. August 28th. And it was interesting because she died two weeks before the inaugural service of the Washington, D.C. International Christian Church. And I remember just thinking, God, I'm in your hands. She's in your hands. I have poured out my heart to her for nine years. But she chose to be sentimental and love her tradition more than the truth. But you know what? I'm grateful. I know God's in control because I had the opportunity to preach about discipleship and baptism to the over 200 people at her funeral. Wow. And I'm like, you know what? To God be the glory. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be praised. He's got the whole world in our hands, guys. Our history, our present, and our future. And as Christians, we should never be afraid, right? You should never be afraid. But the problem is we are. We get afraid. And we start to wonder, does God really have the whole world in his hands? Now that's kind of scary because you know who else talked like that? Did God really say don't take that fruit from the tree? It's satanic. When we start to doubt that God really has the whole world in his hands, we are starting to act and think like Satan. Guys, we live in a world of uncertainty, don't we? Uncertain social conditions, economic conditions, global developments, but it's nothing new. The men and women of the Bible experience wildly fluctuating levels of uncertainty. You think this is crazy? I mean, it is crazy. Guys, I mean, sometimes they felt like life was moving backward and getting worse. And the question still remain, where's God? Is he still in control? Can the world be evangelized again? All these satanic things start coming into our mind. And the answer, guys, is what? Yes, he can. See, guys, God still has the whole world in his hands. You know, Isaiah 60, 22 states, the least of you will become a thousand. The smallest, a mighty nation. I am the Lord and it's time. I will do this swiftly. See, it's according to his timing because God is sovereign. Life is uncertain, but God is not. And we can't allow the devil to steal our confidence. Guys, we have got to be secure that God's at work even in uncertain times and God is sovereign even when we don't like his plans. That's where I had to really come to grips because in my pride, I'm thinking, well, this is not going according to my plan. But Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans of a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Point number one, there's nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new under the sun. Do you really believe that God is sovereign? Guys, the same issues, the same drama, and the same answers still remain. 
There is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we're going to read here in verses 9 and 10. It says here, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. You know, when I share my faith with non-Christians or even brothers and sisters that aren't aligned in our new movement, many are kind of distraught with the conflict. They're distraught and saddened by division within God's universal church. And while division may cause sadness, guys, I, I have to remind them that, hey, division within God's church on earth is nothing new. Why are we surprised? Why are we downtrodden? It's just Satan's ploy to discourage us from being about the work. Guys, while God's plan is perfect, his people are not. Drama, division, and flat-out dereliction is nothing new. It's nothing new. Guys, in the history of Israel, we understand that division was needed for righteous reasons, right? Like when David divided from Saul out of fear of being destroyed. 1 Samuel 27, verse 1 and 2. See now, there, there needs to be division. If you think your spiritual life is about to be destroyed, you need to get up out of there. It's very simple. Okay? Or when the Levites and the priests and all who set their hearts on seeking God sided with Rehoboam and left their property to be with him. 2 Chronicles 11, 13 to 17. I know a lot of people here have left businesses' homes to be with a sold-out movement. Amen? Now, division can be unrighteous, as when David's son Absalom and his closest advisor, Athaphiel, divided from him in 2 Samuel 15 and used deception and treachery to lead the hearts of the men of Israel astray. And we've seen that too. We've seen that in Syracuse. I remember back in the day, 2004, 2005, when all this stuff was going on, and I remember how Chris Broom took a stand. And he said, you know what? I'm trying to get help. I'm trying to get help from all these people around here in New York. No one's calling me back. Bro, figure it out. Then he called Kip. Said, bro, can you help me? Kip's like, come on out. The first conference, we were here, bro. I appreciate your courage. And I got, it, it was intense because I remember during that time, Kip came to us and said, guys, bro, you need to deal with this church within a church that's going on in Syracuse. We came on back and we sat down and we studied with people like, hey, guys, you can't miss midweek for a hair appointment. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ladies, you can't, you can't just lead your husbands and think it's okay. And guys, it got scary. I mean, over 20 people left eventually. And we loved them with the love of the Lord. Right. I remember being in those meetings with the Parlors and Brooms and the Thomases. And the Thomases, they're the most sweetest couple ever. So if anyone tried to say we were being harsh, that's a lie from the devil. <laughs> but I remember sitting down like, guys, if, listen, you know what? If you're going to live this way, then this church is not the church for you. And I appreciate Kip calling us to that. Amen. And because of that, over 20 people left. The president of the board. The people that literally were the biggest financial givers left yep. to God be the glory. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because after they left, all of a sudden an evangelist from the New York City ICUC decides to come up and visit them. Now, this is interesting because I knew this brother. I've, I've, I've stayed in his house. I've played the piano with him and and I'm like, that's interesting, bro. You didn't call me to tell me you were coming on up. Because I just happened to hear from the grapevine. So I called him up and said, hey, bro, I heard you coming into town. Let's get together. Oh, oh, sh sh sure, 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 let's get together. So we get together. I remember it, clear as day, Barnes and Nobles. We go out and we have a little prayer. And we come back and I'm like, bro, I, I just being very straightforward with you. I really believe that was disrespectful what you did. Just coming on into town, you know that Chris went left with the mission team of 16 to plant the Chicago church, amen? And Patrick and I had taken over the church, and he knew this. 
And yet, he didn't call me telling me he was coming into town. I'm like, bro, I thought we were friends. And he's like, bro, yeah, yeah man. Um, I asked my, uh, specifically, I said to him, I was like, bro, let me tell you where this group is at. Let me tell you how you can help them. Because we, we were dealing with people that, I mean, you had a couple that all of a sudden were immoral. Oh, this church accepted them. Another brother, oh, yeah, accepted them. I was like, this is unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's one thing to hear about. It's another thing to see with your own eyes. And it was convicting because I was like, well, hold on a second here. Bro, do you, do you know about their spiritual condition? And before God, he said to me, bro, I don't know anything about their spiritual condition. All I know is that they're against Kip, and that's why I'm here. Wow. So we sat down. We ended up talking about the unity letter and all this stuff. And he's like, bro, the unity letter is garbage. Bro, I agree. Amen? We agree on something. It was a very sad time. But there's nothing new under the sun. Deception and treachery to lead the hearts of Israel astray continues to happen today. After that, an elder from Boston came up. You know, it's funny how people talk about sheep stealing and all this other stuff. It's interesting. I, I, I kind of wonder, they, they, they accuse Kip of sheep, keep sheep stealing and all this nonsense. I'm like, hey, why didn't you guys come talk to us? You know, there's division the for righteous reasons. There's division the for unrighteous reasons. And there's division... The among God's people that he allows to exist. As with Rehoboam and Jeroboam and 1 Kings 12, 20, 20 to 24. In verse 24, the Lord actually says, do not go up to fight against your brothers, the Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this, i.e. the division, is my doing. See, we all get so, oh my gosh, we're divided. You know what? Guys, there's nothing new under the sun. Why? Because God is sovereign. God still got the whole world in his hands. Guys, you know, I read an article that Kip wrote about, you know, just the divided kingdom. And he talked about how sinful division only occurs when people who love God are taken away from him and killed spiritually by those who are spiritually warped and deceived. That's what spiritual division, or rather sinful division is. David was in fear for his life. But guys, unfortunately today, a lot of people don't realize that their spiritual lives are in danger until it's too late. By that time, they're so loaded down with sins and swayed by all kinds of evil desires that they stop being able to acknowledge the truth despite the fact that they continue to attend a lukewarm church. They delude themselves more and more to think it's okay. Turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. You know, time and time again, throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, there were divisions among groups in order to show who had God's approval, right? 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. So what are we to do? Should we go get sad and cry? Or should we hold to the conviction that God has given us? You know, I have very loved brothers and sisters in that break-off group. Loved, I convert some of them. But I am not going to be led astray by sentimentality for you. Guys, we got to learn from the mistakes of the past. And then we need to choose whether we're going to follow God's standards or our own human sentimentality without wavering. First Kings 18, 21. And it's not about what human side to be on. And this is where, this is where you know, our former fellowship gets it so out of whack. It's not about people. It's about the standard. I didn't know all these people. I didn't know all these people in the sold out movement first. I knew more people in the ICOC. But guess what? I'm here with you. Why? Because we're following the correct life and doctrine. It's not about relationships. It can't be about that. Now, amen. We got to love each other and set the example of love. But I'm not following God because of you. My faith is not based on your coattails. But you know what? This whole experience really showed us who's doing this for God and who's doing this for men. When we choose what is right, then and only then can we decide who is right. Philippians chapter 1. 
Philippians chapter 1, it's one of my favorite scriptures here. I did this whole study called, Are You Watching Your Life? Because when all this drama happened in the church, I was like, well, hold on a second. I need to be able to tell the church and help the church understand what the heck is going on. So it started with, you know, 1 Timothy 4, 16, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them and you'll save both yourself and your hearers. Because I realized, hey, doctrine's not the issue right now. Everyone knows you need to repent and be baptized. Although the problem is, is the life. People aren't baptizing disciples. Disciples out the window. Evangelism's gone. And then the next scripture I had in the study was Philippians 1. Philippians 1. In verse 9, it says this. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you will be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Why have I decided to be part of this movement? Because I believe it is the best way to get to heaven. Amen? It is the best way to complete the work that Jesus himself has given us to do to evangelize the world and are just in this generation. And guys, I'm dead serious about this. I mean, I had to really pray this down and think to myself, am I willing to die to make this happen? You know, I appreciate the faith that Kim and Elena have and Patrick and I. We're excited to be here in L.A. But I'll tell you, Johannesburg is the murder capital of the world. And we are about to start a family. This is not a game. I have counted the cost. We have counted the cost. I've counted the cost. If my wife dies on mission field, I've counted the cost. If our baby dies on the mission field, she's counted the cost. If I die on the mission field, it's not about me, but I, you know, my wife, you, brothers, you know. But to God be the glory because we know where we're going. Amen. And you know what's really powerful? Is that the church in Syracuse was planted because Ron Drabo, an evangelist there, one of his babies, one of his sons died in Johannesburg because, because the nurse had a cold and gave it to his baby. And that baby died. And, and, and Steve Johnson was leading the New York City church at the time, said, bro, what can I do for you? He said, Ron said, bro, plant a church in my hometown of Syracuse. And because of that, I'm a Christian today. You know, I enjoy being a student of church history. And um, I remember reading The Eternal Kingdom by F.W. Maddox. It's one of my favorite books. He's a mainline Church of Christ guy. You got to eat the fish, spit out the bone. (laughs) But recently for our D.C. staff meeting... We watched the first volume of I Have Chosen You, the history of God's church from 3080 to 1978, given right here in L.A. back in 2000. I believe our own Marty uh, Marty Wooten shared for that. And, you know, it's interesting because at this point, there's nothing new under the sun. The same issues of controversy that have divided movements of the past are the same today, and it was the same thing they talked about on that tape. It was intense. Sam Lang was just sharing these things, and you're sharing, number one, these are the issues of controversy. Number one, do all Christians have to be evangelistic? Two, does every person need to make Jesus Lord before they get baptized? Three, does everyone need to be in a discipling relationship? Four, do we need to have unity instead of autonomy? This is on the tape, 2000. It was like he was prophesying what was going to happen. And I dare say, do we need to date and marry only disciples of Jesus? Another issue. But why do these issues continue to surface? Well, guess what? The answers remain the same as well. Here's what he shared. Number one, the leaders within the movement are not united. Number two, total commitment was only an ideal and not the standard. Number three, the leadership was not involved in each other's lives. Number four, there was no plan for world evangelism and unity. Number five, there were defensive compromises in order to pacify the fellowship. Come on, Andrew. Guys, 
There's nothing new under the sun. The same issues, the same answers still remain. And you know, the challenge we face and will continue to face is to remain humble. To remain humble and never weak in our conviction or conceited in our pride. And God, I pray that God will use us to evangelize the world in this generation if we hold on to the truth in humility and learn from the mistakes of the past. Guys, we've got to trust God's sovereignty and imitate God's heart to glorify him by completing the work he's given us to do. John 17. John 17, point number two. John 17, point number two. Pray and put your hand to the plow until peace comes. And after that, too. (laughs) Pray and put your hand to the plow. Why? Because God is sovereign. Because God is still in control. He's got the whole world in his hands. You know, I preached recently on John 17. And uh, the title of the message was The Greatest Prayer Ever Prayed. Because really, we see three things that Jesus prays about right here. He prays to glorify God. He prays for humility, to glorify God. He prays for the purity of the church, sanctify the, the church by the word of God. And he prayed for the unity of the kingdom. Well, in John 17, starting in verse 20, it says here, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity. To let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Every day, I've got to ask myself now, am I praying to glorify God? Am I praying to have a pure heart? Am I praying for the unity of the kingdom? You see, Jesus prayed for a unity, a unity that would show his love to the world. It was a unity based on conviction and not on compromise. Because unity for the sake of unity isn't righteous either. The people building the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, were united as well. They were united in disobedience. God said, hey, be fruitful and scatter. They said, no, we're going to stay and build our own kingdom up to the sky. Guys, it is intense. There's nothing new under the sun. But that's why we got to pray and put our hand to the plow until peace comes. You know, God is controlled because despite all their plans, he confused their language and scattered them anyway. See, God's still in control, guys. God is still in control. And you know, many autonomous churches today are just concerned on building their own kingdoms, guys. I, I remember this quote by Edmund Burke. It says, he said that whatever disunites man from God is what disunites man from man. So if there's pride and lack of humility between man and God, there'll be pride and lack of humility between man to man. See, the guys, the the lust for position, the lust for pleasure, the lust and comfortability, the lust for selfish gain is the world's tool to distract us from God's agenda. And we can claim to follow God wholeheartedly, but we can also allow the past to distract us, guys. You know, we we can kind of get off track. We stop praying. We start, oh, woe is me. We stop trying to study the Bible with people. And instead, we're wondering about how are we going to make everything come back together. Guys, while people are just walking us by, just walking right past us. Turn to Luke chapter 9. Guys, we can stop praying for unity of conviction and start praying for unity because of past relationships. There are some people I talk to who are remnant, who just want to get unified because they want to see their friend again. They want to get accepted by their friend again. And I'm like, well, you're not getting united on conviction. You're not praying for conviction, for unity on conviction. You're praying for unity on compromise. In Luke chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 60, 
One, we see the cost of following Jesus. And it says here, still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, what you said is good. Why not? Go ahead. No, that's, 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 that's the book of second opinions. This guy says, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. <laughs> that's pretty hardcore right there. <laughs> Guys, okay. The half-hearted disciple that Luke is talking about right here hasn't really completely cut his tie with the past. And he wants to go back. And say goodbye. I wish they would accept me again. I wish I could say goodbye to them. And as a result, he stops bringing glory to God by completing the work because he's too busy saying goodbye to the past. That's what's happening, guys. I want to say goodbye. I want to say goodbye. Put your hand to the plow. Keep your eyes straight in front of you. Guys, it is intense here. He was constantly looking back instead of looking forward. How about you this morning? You still looking back? I remember the days. See, I got baptized in 2000, so I was kind of at the the edge of things. I saw it at its glory, and then boom. I was there in Washington, D.C., for that ACR conference, right? That was my first conference. And uh, it, it was intense, guys. But, you know, why do people constantly look back? And especially with the remnant, this is huge because they, the people have lost hope. They don't trust the future. The security is in the past. And Jesus' response to that attitude is that they're not fit to serve in God's kingdom. You know, the prophet Isaiah warns us of this in chapter 43. Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. He states this, forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Guys, if we decide to forget what is behind us, and strain toward what is ahead. Philippians 3, we will achieve the goal yeah. of evangelizing the world in this generation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But we need to prepare ourselves through prayer, guys. Now I appreciate Kip's message calling us to pray. Because we're going to have deal with the controversy and the conflict by the, you know, the naysayers and the bystanders. Yeah. You know, you got the people that, you know, uh, the, the, <laughs> I always remember the quote. Um, either you're part of the problem, part of the solution, or part of the landscape. (laughs) There's always people kind of just watching, well, what's going to happen? Let's just see. You know, JFK once said, there'll always be dissident voices heard in the land expressing opposition without alternatives. Finding fault, but never favor. Perceiving gloom, on every side and seeking influence without responsibility. Guys, I want to be a leader. Oh, let's, let's talk about it, bro. Let's take response. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know, many people lose heart when they see a lack of unity. But again, the scriptures remind us again that this is not new. I, I found this quote by Martin Luther. And he he had talked about the disagreement between Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15. Check this out. He says, here it appears either Paul or Barnabas went too far. It must have been a violent disagreement to separate two associates who were so closely united. Indeed, the text indicates as such. Such examples are written for our consolation. For it is a great comfort to us to hear that great saints who have the Spirit of God, amen, also struggle 
Those who say that saints do not sin will deprive us of this comfort. Samson, David, and many other celebrated men full of the Holy Spirit fell into grievous sins. Job and Jeremiah cursed the day of their birth. Elijah and Jonah were weary of life and desired death. No one has ever fallen so grievously that he may not rise again. And we can see that with our brother Kip, don't we guys? Conversely, no one stands so firmly that he may not fall. If Peter and Paul and Barnabas fell, I too may fall. This is Martin Luther speaking. If they rose again, I too may rise again. Guys, why? Because God is sovereign. If we pray and put our hand to the plow, God can use us. My last point is simply this. Hope. In seemingly hopeless times. Hope in seemingly hopeless times. You know, in D.C., it's all about hope. Obama's the hope of the world. And you know, it's interesting because he wrote this book called The Audacity of Hope. How could you be hopeful? <laughs> Whatever. How are we supposed to be hopeful? In a hopelessly broken world. That's the way the world thinks. Why? Because God is sovereign. Because he's still got the whole world in his hands. Turn to Psalms 31. And we're going to close out here. Psalms 31. How are we supposed to stay hopeful in a quote-unquote hopelessly broken world? You know, we want to be hopeful. But when relationships sour and stock prices tumble and dreams disappear and plans crumble and all that nonsense, hope can be kind of hard to come by. I mean, I, I remember guys in Syracuse where, you know, after all the drama, it, it was pretty intense. It was, I mean, I, I think that God was like, okay, well, let's see how you earn your stripes here. And, um, you know, we saw over 20 people. This is, we, we got a... We got the little church that could, amen? amen? And, you know, we saw out of that little church, 20 people, over 20 people leave. I mean, that's intense. Okay? Then, you know, the valiant wars of the Chicago church, 16 strong, went out to plant the church in Chicago. And what an awesome work that's been. And then Patrick and I were like, amen? Amen? God is God, and we're not. We're going to pray and put our hand to the plow. Now, guys, it was, it, it was weak. It was, it was intense. And, you know, people, we had to go through the church and, and let, one by one go through. Go through. And, guys, God worked because literally 31 people got baptized in the short time we, we were there. 31 people got baptized in that little over a year and a half. Five people got restored. Three people moved in to Syracuse, New York. Snow and all. I remember the day. We were like, you know what? Hey, Amen. we're going to trust God. I remember Syracuse University, where three campus students got baptized on one day at Syracuse. It never happened in the church. And the church was like, oh, baby. I feel a little wind beneath my wings right here. Maybe we just all started to sing around, sing a little kumbaya. But it, it was all, God started to work. Because we realized, hey, this is nothing new. We just got to pray and put our hands to the plow. And we got to continue to hope in seemingly hopeless times. Guys, it was intense. And, you know, from the ashes, God can bring it up. So if anyone, if you think, oh, my position can't change, my tr guys, God can bless it. God can absolutely bless it. But you know, for us, the hopes are a little different. Because people think, well, what about my finances? What about my family? What about my friends? You know, and we start to lose a little bit of hope. Man, I put my heart and soul into this and it hasn't bared as much fruit as I'd like. I don't know where you're at this morning, but do you really trust your God? 
do you really believe that God has the whole world in his hands? And he's got your life in his hands. Guys, I remember the call to come to D.C. And I remember, you know us, but you know the story. We put our house on, on the market. And in Syracuse, man, it was like, there was no, it was nice. It was a great spot. We had a three-bedroom house. Oh, two bedroom. And no one's, there was no other houses for sale. None. All of a sudden, we put our house on the market. One house right next door to us up for sale. Now, we all understand that when another house comes up for sale, what happens to the value of your house? It starts to go down. Okay, God's in control, God's in control, I'm going to continue to hope. Because it was a tough time. I mean, it's like, you know, mortgage and all this stuff is bad. Guys, in the weeks that followed, another house. Another house for sale. Another house for sale. I, I could not believe it. I could not, but like literally, it was like God himself was like, watch me. And I'm like, I'm going to hope, mind you, of all these houses, at the end of the day, it was seven houses up for sale on our one street. I, before God is the truth. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Well, I'm going to continue to hope because God has the whole world in his hands. So, well, we continue to pray. Now, this is huge because our house was the only house that didn't have a garage. In Syracuse, New York. Who wants to park their car with five feet of snow on it? Outside. We said God's in control. Well, guys, we put our house for sale. We, we went out, I think we went to take a vacation. It was, it was, it was like, it was, it was just a lot. I'm going to go hope and pray. All of a sudden, call from the realtor. I think we got one. And we start talking. And I end up finding out this girl was from Maryland. We're going to D.C. Get out of here. We're going to start a ministry at University of Maryland. Oh, my God. So I'm like, pray, God, please, God, please. Of all the houses, our house sells. Hope and seemingly hopeless times. Psalms 31. We're going to close out here. Psalm 31, it says this. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. You know, it's pretty interesting. Just to stop right here. You see here that David literally has trusted God in the past. Verse 1, in you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Verse 2, turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge. Now it's the present. And in verse 3 it says, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me for the future. We got to trust God past, present, and future. Flee me from, flee, free me from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Who said that? Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. I hate those who cling to worthless idols. I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in your love, for you saw my affliction and you knew the anguish of my soul. God has the whole world in his hands. You think he doesn't know what you're going through? You have not handed me over to the enemy, but have set my feet in a spacious place. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. You ever feel that way? My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction. And my bones grow weak. Because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors. You ever feel that way? I am a dread to my friends. 
Those who see me on the street flee from me. You're just fellowship. I don't want to be around you. I am forgotten by them as though I were dead. I have become like broken pottery. For I hear the slander of many. There is terror on every side. They conspire against me and they plot to take my life. But, but, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from my enemies and from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I have cried out to you. You know, it's interesting here. Would you say this is a pretty intense thing David's going through? Yeah. Pretty hopeless thing. You ever, you ever wonder, like, man, why is all this stuff happening? Why is all, this is nothing new. But what, what is David doing here? He's praying and continuing to put his hand to the plow. He continues to believe. It says here, but let the wicked be put to shame and lie silent in the grave. Verse 18, let their lying lips be silenced. For with pride and contempt, they speak arrogantly against the righteous. How great is your goodness which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. In the shelter of your presence, you hide them from the intrigues of men. In your dwelling, you keep them safe from accusing tongues. Is this an intense psalm or what? Praise be to the Lord for he's shown his wonderful love to me when I was in a besieged city, our besieged kingdom. In my alarm, I said, I'm cut off from your sight. Yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Love the Lord, all his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful. But the proud, he pays back in full. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. What are we to do, guys? What are we to do? Love God and stay faithful. You know, we've trusted God in the past. We've trusted God in the present. And we've got to trust God in the future. Why? Because God is sovereign. You know, I'll close here with some excerpts from John F. Kennedy's inaugural address in 1961. He was going through some crazy stuff too. Cold War, all this drama. And I'm going to put a little twist on it. It says, let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century tempered by war disciplined by a hard and bitter peace proud of their ancient heritage and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those spiritual standards that which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. And so, my fellow disciples, ask not what the kingdom can do for you, but what you can do for the kingdom. My fellow citizens, ask not what the world will do for you, but together what we can do for the freedom of the world. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. Let us begin anew, remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Finally, whether you are citizens of God's kingdom or citizens of the world, ask of us the same high standards of strength and sacrifice we ask of you, discipling. With heaven and a good conscience, our sure reward, with God, the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love. Asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly 
be our own. Is God's work truly yours? Have we taken the responsibility to see the world one for him? We got to trust God's sovereignty, guys. There's nothing new under the sun. Pray and put your hand to the plow and put your hope not in things of this world, but in the kingdom that will never be shaken, a kingdom that not even the demons of hell can overcome. Why? Why should we believe this? Because God really has the whole world in his hands. Thank you. Yeah.